I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to go see Fast X. You see this? The last one of these things absolutely obliterated any goodwill I had remaining after the fate of the Furious, even though I really like that film. Dare I say my favorite Fast and Furious movie. But look, that movie took the perfect heartfelt ending of Furious 7 and just decided to keep going anyway. And even though I love that movie, it's safe to say that probably wasn't the right move for the franchise. Simply put, this franchise doesn't work without Paul Walker. So forget about it, cuz. These films were Brian's films. He was their beating heart. He was the protagonist, our entryway into this world of street racing and heists and I guess international espionage and so forth. Dominic Toretto was always a side character. He was always Bodie to Paul Walker's Johnny Utah and never compelling enough to carry this entire franchise on his own. Never mind Roman Pierce or any of the other members of the crew. Hobbs and Shaw, you know, was a cool little experiment. He was fine, but that movie worked because it was just the two of them. It was just thriving on the charisma of The Rock and Jason Statham. After F9, I really didn't even want to watch a Fast and Furious film helmed by anyone. But for some reason, when I talk about Fast and Furious, you guys really want to hear about it. <laughs> well, here you go, guys. We were at the bottom of the barrel before, but Fast X punched a hole through the barrel and a couple inches of the floor for good measure and said, now we've hit damn bottom or rock bottom. I don't know, Gal Gadot got thrown off a cliff in the sixth one. Dominic Toretto drove his car off a dam this time around. Pick your preference. Brass tacks. Fast X, as I'm sure you can imagine, sucks. Is it possible that these things can get worse than F9? Uh, kinda? It's at least competing with F9 for the worst movie in the franchise. If that's what you came here to find out, consider it found out. But if you actually do want to hear a little more, well, let's go on a bit of a trip. We're gonna follow the Fast crew to Rome, to Rio, and to Portugal with really bad location cards this time around, and it might do us some good to learn a bit of the local language, but, uh, unless you want to take lessons from Roman... That's not Spanish. Maybe we'd better ask the professionals. Today's sponsor, Babbel, is here to keep you on the right track. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world and has been scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in three weeks thanks to its world-class lessons designed by real language teachers. Babbel teaches real-world conversations and prepares you to talk about travel, business, relationships, and more. So when you do plan your next big job overseas and need to blend in conversationally or you want to use your communication skills to go from being being the Ramsey or Tej of the group to being its natural leader like Roman Pierce, Babbel puts you on the best foot forward. I've been to Europe a few times, but I've never been to Germany, and it's a country that I've always wanted to go to, so with Babbel, I've actually been studying German a bit, and in my short time as a user, I've gone from not understanding a word to being able to actually watch a German film without the subtitles. I might need a little bit of a crutch there and have them there, but you know what, it's good. I, 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 can, I can hear it and, and it makes sense, and it's starting to feel like second in nature thanks to the way their lessons are structured. So what are you waiting for? Spring is here and everyone's anxious to go to Europe. And if you want to blend in better, start learning with Babbel now. And you can be speaking a new language in time for your big adventure this summer and beyond. Babbel offers a 20 day money back guarantee and you can get 60% off on your subscription at the link in the description below. That's 60% off on your subscription at the link in the description below. And thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Now that we're done learning a language of our choosing, let's talk about the visual language of the Fast franchise. Comparatively to where we're at now, with the budgets of these movies, the first one of these was made with the measly $38 million price tag. But through the time where we sadly had to say goodbye to Brian, it very much defined the style of these films. There was a grounded sense to the stunts and camera work that, though at times they would go a bit crazy, depicting the use of NOS as if it's the fucking jump to hyperspace in Star Wars, you might mostly understood that what you are seeing is really happening. Now with this film, you got like a $350 million budget and that's just uh, 
Oh my god, that is so much to spend on this franchise. They seem to have lost that grounded sensibility. Even within that though, these films have always been about upping the car chase in cinema, seeing how extreme and engaging they can get with it. But they've gone over the hump, they've jumped the shark. There is only so much you can do with a car, and even though there are many ways to make that engaging, you hit a point where the internal logic of your universe demands you up what is happening. And that has led us to our new point in the franchise where everything feels like it's done without weight, filmed on a green screen and overall generated in a computer. And look, this isn't a new thing for the franchise, and it won't be a surprise, maybe unless Fast X is the first Fast and Furious film you've ever seen, but it's not getting any better from there. In Furious 7, we had these scenes of jumping between huge towers with cars. It's ridiculous. It's obviously CGI. No one would do that with a real car, let alone be able to survive that. But there is a sense of danger. There's a sense of weight. You feel as though that car could really do it. And that's because not only is this a well-executed scene, but the story has the weight that makes it necessary. At that point in the franchise, if a character was dead, they would stay dead. Except for Letty, but pretty much everyone feels okay that Letty survived, so, you know, she gets a pass, that's fine. But Han died, Gal Gadot died, and at this point, they were not coming back. Now, all of the action is meaningless. You're told there are stakes, but you don't ever believe there are stakes. At this point, we've been conditioned to think that even if you're told a character dies, they can just get back up and dust themselves off. No one's ever in any real danger. We're constantly told in Fast X that this is big. How will the Fast Fam ever come back from this? They're scattered, disavowed by the government, with Dante pulling the strings and always with the upper hand. But because of our preconceived ideas of this franchise, these claims of the devil is coming and Dom playing catch up to the enemy are meaningless. To compare these ideas of weight, let's now discuss the big, for lack of a better term, Rocket League section of this film. Roman, Tej, Ramsey, and Han go on a mission that they think is for the dumb secret agency, but it turns out that it's actually a trap set for them by surprise, Dante. He put a bomb in the back of a car and threw some shenanigans and again, the bomb is loose in the streets of Rome. So now, utilizing what can only be described as car ate, Dom and his crew save civilians from random fireball explosions, a bomb rolling out of control like it's a Katamari game, all the while driving their cars in a way that no longer feels grounded. It's not even the fact that something this ridiculous happens. I know damn well going into a Fast and Furious movie, we've left reality entirely, but it's the fact that it didn't used to be be this way. These films used to have heightened elements, sure, physically and logically inaccurate even, and that's okay. But I still believed what was happening because there was some level of practical stunt work being done to tether me to the ground. And yes, for this film, they actually shot in Rome. It's incredible to see the behind the scenes of what they were trying to do here. Jason Momoa is really on that motorcycle and it looks like he's having the time of his life. But in the end product, none of this on the ground shooting really comes through. Everything feels as though it's made on a green screen. And this isn't always a bad thing. The end of Avengers Endgame, another $350 million movie, is basically all green screen. And I'm not saying that movie has the best effects, but I feel the emotional stakes of the scene. I understand what every character can do and what happens if they lose. The reality they have crafted is one in which all of it makes sense to me. But here, within the reality this series has constructed, I just don't buy or believe any of it because the characters act like these are regular occurrences. There's no challenge, no risk, no difficulty, and that comes through in how these set pieces are constructed. And this brings us back to the idea of them trying to up the ante of the car chase on film. When you add layers, construct set pieces that build upon that foundation while still, at its core, maintain the ethos of the car chase people start to get really excited, especially when it's these gorgeous looking sports cars most of us can never afford doing shit for real. That's why the vault scene in Fast Five, one of the best car chases in movies in the modern era, feels so fun and has such tangible stakes. It is real. Not all of it is, obviously, but as an audience member, you're saying, wow, they really did that. But from F9 onwards, and I know some of you would be saying, oh, well, really, it's Fate of the Furious. Look, there will probably be a defense 
in that movie because Fate of the Furious fucking rules. They've not only left reality, but these characters, these set pieces, are all homogenous gobbledygook. It's overworking our suspension of disbelief and making everything in the film feel and look worse. To really nail that point down, let's talk about when Brie Larson, who feels kind of wasted in this movie, is introduced as Mr. Nobody's daughter opposite TV's Jack Reacher, Alan Richardson. This scene looks and feels really weird. Not only are these two characters who we just met now recapping the last nine movies, which really feels like information we just needed to have to fully get what's happening in this movie, but it relies so heavily on the lore of the series and specifically specifically the events of Fast Five. Now, on one hand, I get it. You probably don't expect people to remember everything that's happened the previous nine films, but at the same time, if your entire tenth one relies on the audience's familiarity with Fast and Furious characters, lore, events, the random dude on a bridge five films ago who turns into someone that's doing something important, you're trying to do two things that don't really work, and so you're bogging the whole thing down. Not only that, but the way it recaps the previous nine films, the shadow-faced vote to hunt down the fast crew, the really bad CGI Black Abyss Fox X-Men Cerebro-like platform the scene is set on, forcing the idea onto the story that Dom and his family are yet again fugitives of the government. Another big problem with this whole scene, and really the Fast series post-7, is this weird government agency bent. It's just not interesting. The overall espionage element of these films detracts from the often very personal connections these characters have with the antagonists. It turns everything into a job for them with weird fake spy jargon. Who and what we care about has always been the family. Or the cars and the cars doing flips or whatever. I don't know what your tastes are. I don't know why you enjoy Fast and Furious, probably just for the excitement of it all. But what these scenes really boil down to is trying to figure out the internal logic and lore of the series. And it's really just a nightmare to listen to that makes makes your eyes glaze over because we have no emotional connection to any of that element of the world and it's just the most cliche like spy 101 phrasing that you can think of. It's not even interesting spycraft. And now we don't even get to have this delivered to us by the ever charismatic Kurt Russell who really kind of revels in those exchanges. I guess he's just too busy finding more artistic fulfillment in playing Santa Claus on Netflix twice. and. Honestly, I can't blame him. And that's a big problem with the characters. They no longer feel creatively fulfilling because they've all started to fill the same archetype. Dom's personality has just been copied and pasted onto the rest of the cast. No one has their specialized skills that make them fit to be a part of the team they're building for each mission they have to go on. Remember when there were just those two guys who would come in and do some shenanigans, like make a toilet fully explode while some guy was sitting on it, definitely giving him a new found fear of using public bathrooms, they had a very specific skill there. Dom could not make toilets blow up, but now everyone's the same, and even Dominic Toretto doesn't feel like Dominic Toretto anymore. Sure, he still cares about family, whatever that means at this point, but compare Dom in Fast X to Dom in Fast Five, the movie directly referenced in this film, and they couldn't be further from each other. The core value of family is still at the center of these films, sure, but it doesn't feel genuine anymore. It feels like an obligation of the franchise because that's what these movies are always trying to get us to understand. But when the movie loses that core tenet and has it in name only, what is the point of it all? It's evident that really the horror of this series has become Vin Diesel, where he's kind of just playing to an audience of one. Now, when making a movie, you should make something that you, the artist, wants to see, but you also need to understand what the wider audience will enjoy, and here it feels like there isn't enough focus given to each storyline. The idea of separating the family and eliminating all of their resources is interesting, but the only storyline given proper focus is Dom's. Everyone else feels a bit like filler until they can intersect with Dom again because the writers are saying, oh shit, we gotta include them. Everyone who's ever been in a Fast and Furious movie has to be in this movie, even if we don't really have 
anything for them to do. The two best examples of this are Charlize Theron's Cypher and Jason Momoa's Dante. Cypher feels forced into this story. At the beginning, she just shows up at Dom's house and through a flashback warns him of Dante. Cool. Great, we know our villain. Then she disappears for a long time, and when we see her again, she's been captured and put into the same prison as Letty. We then learn that Cypher is actually there to help Letty escape, but Letty hates her, so instead, they fight, and then like 15 minutes later, they just escape together. It feels disjointed and like it's added because we still haven't finished Cypher's story in these films, but no one really knows what to do with her. Now, on the complete opposite side of the spectrum is Dante. Outside of the opening, which feels disjointed and adding him to the chase scene of Fast Five, because the filmmaking styles are so drastically different between that film and Fast X, Dante is easily the best part of this movie. I'll say that with a grain of salt because his performance is basically just just fully camp, which feels very odd for the characters of this franchise who are supposed to be so fucking earnest in what they're doing, it hurts, but once you accept that this is where we're going with the character, you'll fall in love with him. The scene where he talks to two corpses as if they're still alive is a lot of fun, even if it feels so disturbing and dark and out of place in this movie. In isolation, it's great. And look, it can't make up for all the misdeeds of the film, but it's clear Dante was given more time because he is so directly placed into Dom's story for this film. It's clear what the people behind the camera do and don't care about. It's just that they didn't feel the need to trim the fat when there's actually a lot of stuff that could have been cut out of this. And speaking of that runtime, I think there's an easy fix for this. A lot of how the story is told in Fast X is we're told one thing, see that same thing played out after we already know the outcome and then cut back to the characters still talking about the same thing we've been harping on for the past 30 minutes. The characters are as absurdly behind the audience as the action is silly. I'm constantly waiting at checkpoints for the characters to get there, which adds to the larger sense of boredom I felt in this film, something I never thought I would say coming out of a Fast and Furious movie. And you know what it really comes down to? The fact that there's just so many goddamn characters in this film. It's like a freaking clown car. And and they don't all need to be in there. As I've said, Dom and Dante, that's the conflict here. That's where most of the time should be spent. And we should eliminate the excess unless it directly pertains to that central plot. These stories used to be so straightforward and light that you could kind of just go along with the ride. There's this pompous self-importance that has taken over in these last couple of films and it's insufferable, man. The screenplays are fighting to be more to explore themes, but they're half-assing it. What used to actually really be stories about found family have become more bland blockbusters that contain the word family to keep the brand synergy going. Fast X wants to be a movie discussing legacy, fatherhood, and what it means to form that connection with your child. But there is almost no screen time dedicated to this, and what is there is messy as all hell. Dante is taking revenge on Dom for killing his father and now Dom is setting out to protect his family, including his son. But for most of the film, Dom's son is having light, fun adventures with Uncle John Cena accidentally running into Debbie Ryan at the airport in a blink and you'll miss it cameo. So in the end, that theme doesn't feel like it reaches any sort of conclusion. Yeah, I get it. We still have two more films in this trilogy, but this movie is still a movie and should function as such. They found a point in the middle and they're just like, we're gonna cut it there, we'll see you later. Do you remember the trailers for those ridiculous movies that played at the start of Tropic Thunder? The movies that are deliberately designed to be ridiculous schlock that make no sense? Sadly, that fake blockbuster quality is what this series has become. They've become a bit. We feel as though we are witnessing the scorcher with babies strapped to his chest take on global warming. The thing is that in Fast X, we are supposed to take all of it deadly seriously and we just don't. I mean, I 
guess there's like a level of self-awareness in there, but it's also contrasted with self-seriousness. And again, you can't have two of these things clashing. You gotta pick something. There was a point where we would have taken all of this seriously. Back when these were Brian's movies, back when this franchise had characters that spent time drinking their Coronas together and giving us a reason to care, giving us a wide array of people to grow attached to. We're now existing in the post Furious 7 world, which would have been a beautiful send off to the franchise, allowing us to go off on a wonderful celebration of the memory of Paul Walker and the passion that he put into this series. He's always been the heart of these movies. At this point, it feels as though all that heart is gone though. All that's left is product that gives us no weight, nothing to care about, and that sucks, man. Throughout the past year, we have learned that blockbusters can be so much more, with the likes of films like Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and Top Gun Maverick, Dune, No Time to Die, we've seen emotional storytelling still find its place in blockbuster cinema. And that's not to say that the Fast Saga has to carry that emotional weight, but it needs to get us invested. It needs to let us care so that we can have the big bombastic car based fun that is promised to us. And with the box office returns of this movie, maybe one of these days we'll be able to get something more like Fast Five, where you can feel the tension, feel the characters, feel the emotion of a story crafted by people who care. Maybe they'll course correct in the next film. I have no idea, and Universal will be able to truly give us a great blockbuster franchise again, because it's not enough to just be an action movie anymore. Uh, well, if all else fails, I guess Vin Diesel can probably just bankroll 11 and 12 himself because he's got nothing better to do. Ooh.